Uh, well, thank you very much, Deepa, that's very kind. And thank you so much to Stefania for writing a book that, an important work on uh, giving us the chronology of what happened to uh, WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange. Um, I thoroughly recommend it. But what I want to do uh, in my contribution is to focus on the title of tonight and look at how WikiLeaks challenge the model of democratic media, um, how it presented a, a challenge to how we think democratic media operates. Um, and I want to um, quote uh, at length um, a comment that Julian Assange made back in 2011 um, when he was talking about what he called perceived moral institutions, such as the liberal media. And this is what he said. What drives a paper like The Guardian or The New York Times is not their inner moral values, it is simply that they have a market. In the UK there is a market called educated liberals. Educated liberals want to buy a newspaper like The Guardian, and therefore an institution arises to fulfil that market. What is the, in the newspaper is not a reflection of the values of the people in that institution, it is a reflection of the market demand. Now, Assange presumably came to that insight, having just spent uh, a year working with those two newspapers on the Afghan and Iraq war logs. I think one of the mistakes we typically make when we think about the so-called mainstream media is imagining that its outlets evolve in some kind of gradual bottom-up process. We're encouraged to assume that there's at least an element of voluntary association in how media institutions form. At its simplest, we imagine journalists with a liberal or left-wing outlook coalescing, gravitating towards other journalists with a similar outlook, and together they produce a left-wing or a liberal newspaper. I think we sometimes assume the same thing about the right one too. All of this <coughs> requires, <coughs> sorry, requires ignoring the elephant in the room, billionaire owners. Even if we think about the owners, and we're usually discouraged to do so, we tend to suppose that their role is to provide funding for these free exercises in journalistic collaboration. For that reason, we infer that the media represents society. It offers a marketplace of thought and expression in which ideas and opinions align with the vast majority of the population. In short, the media reflects a spectrum of acceptable ideas rather than defining and imposing that spectrum. Of course, this idea is ludicrous if we pause to think about it. The media consists of outlets owned by and serving the interests of billionaires and large corporations, or in the case of the BBC, a broadcasting corporation entirely reliant on state largesse. Furthermore, almost all media corporations need advertising revenue from other large corporations to avoid hemorrhaging money. There's nothing bottom-up about this process. It's entirely top-down. Journalists operate within this, these ideological parameters. They're strictly laid down by their outlet's owners. The media doesn't reflect society. It reflects the interests of a small elite and the national security state that promotes and protects the elite's interests. Those parameters are wide enough to allow some disagreement, just enough to make Western societies look democratic. But the parameters are narrow enough to restrict reporting, analysis, and commentary so that dangerous ideas, dangerous to corporate, corporate state power, almost never get a look in. Put bluntly, media, media pluralism is the spectrum of allowable thought among the power elite. If this doesn't seem obvious, it might help to think of media outlets like any other large corporation. Let's take an example, the supermarket chain. Supermarkets a large warehouse-like venue stocking a wide range of goods arranged similar to the other ones, but usually there's a slight variation in pricing and branding. Despite this essential similarity, each supermarket markets itself as radically different from its rivals. It's easy to fall for this pitch, and most of us do, to the extent that we end up identifying with a particular supermarket over another one, believing it shares our values or it embodies our ideals or it aspires to things that we hold dear. We all know there's a difference between 
a Waitrose and a Tesco, but we might struggle to identify exactly what that difference amounts to. It's hard to know beyond the competing marketing strategies and the targeting of different shopping audiences. All supermarkets share a core capitalist ideology. All are pathologically driven by the need to generate profits. All try to fuel rapacious consumerism among their customers. All create excessive demand and waste. All externalize their costs onto the wider society. Now let's bring it back to the media. They're there to do essentially the same thing, each of them. They can only monetize their similarity by presenting marketing it as a difference. They brand themselves differently, not because they are different, but because to be effective, not always profitable, they must reach and capture different demographics. Supermarkets do it through different emphases, maybe promoting Coca-Cola over wine, or accentuating their green credentials and their promotion of animal welfare over value for money. It's no different with the media. Outlets brand themselves as liberal or conservative on the side of the middle classes or on the side of the unskilled worker, as challenging the powerful or being respectful of the powerful. The key task of a supermarket is to create loyalty from a section of the shopping public to stop those customers straying to other supermarkets. Similarly, a media outlet reinforces a supposed set of shared values among a specific demographic to stop readers straying to other publications, looking elsewhere for their news, their commentary, and their analysis. The goal of the media is not unearthing the truth. It's not about monitoring the centers of power. It's about capturing readers. Insofar as a media outlet does monitor power, or it does speak difficult truths, it does so because that's its brand. That's what its audience has come to expect of it. So how does that relate to this topic today? Well, not least it helps clarify something that baffles me at least, and probably some of you as well. Why haven't journalists risen up to support Julian Assange in their droves? Especially once Sweden dropped the longest preliminary investigation in its history, and it became clear that Assange's persecution was, as he always warned, paving the way to his extradition to the US for exposing its war crimes. The truth is that were The Guardian and The New York Times to have clamoured for his freedom, had they investigated the glaring holes in the Swedish case, as Nils Meltzer has done, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, were they screaming about the dangers of allowing the US to redefine journalism's core task, not as treason, or if they had uh, been screaming about how the Espionage Act was being used, to redefine journalism as treason, had they used their substantial muscle and resources to pursue a freedom of information request as Stefani has done on her own dime? Were they pointing out the endless legal abuses taking place in Assange's treatment in the UK? Had they reported rather than ignored the facts that came to light in the extradition hearings in London? In short, had they kept Julian Assange's persecution in the spotlight, he'd be free by now. The efforts by the various <laughs> the efforts by the various states involved to gradually disappear him over the past decade would have become futile. They would have been self-sabotaging. At some levels, journalists understand this, which is precisely why they try to persuade themselves and you that he's not a proper journalist. That's why they tell themselves they don't need to show solidarity with him. And why some of them even amplify the state's demonization campaign against him. By ignoring Julian Assange, by othering him, they can avoid thinking about the differences between what he has done and what they do. Journalists can avoid examining their own role as captured servants of corporate power. Assange faces 175 years in a maximum security prison, not for espionage, but for publishing journalism. Journalism doesn't require some special professional qualification, as brain surgery and conveyancing does. It doesn't depend on precise, abstruse, 
knowledge of human physiology or legal procedure. At its best, journalism is simply gathering and publishing information that serves the public interest. Public, that's you and me. It doesn't require a diploma, it doesn't require a big building or a wealthy owner. Whisper it, any of us can do journalism. And when we do it, journalistic protections ought to apply. Assange excelled at journalism like no one before him because he devised a new model of forcing governments to become more transparent and public servants more honest, which is precisely why the elite who wield secret power want him and that model destroyed. If the liberal media was really organised from the bottom up rather than the top down, journalists would be incensed and terrified by states torturing one of their own. They'd be genuinely afraid that they might be targeted next. Because it's the practice of pure journalism that is under attack, not a single journalist. But how is that, how, how, that isn't how corporate journalists see it. And truth be told, their abandonment of Julian Assange, the lack of solidarity they've shown, is explicable. Journalists aren't being entirely irrational. The corporate media, especially its liberal outlets and their journalist servants, understand that Assange's media revolution, embodied by a WikiLeaks venture, is far more of a threat to them than the national security state. Put crudely, the liberal media views WikiLeaks as a threat, much as the high street does Amazon. Though, of course, that analogy unfairly strips out WikiLeaks' far more noble purpose and methods than Amazon's. WikiLeaks offers a new kind of platform for democratic journalism, in which secret power, along with its inherent corruptions and crimes, becomes much harder to wield. And as a result, corporate journalists have had to face some difficult home truths that they'd avoided until WikiLeaks' appearance. First, the media revolution threatens to undermine the role and privileges of the corporate journalist. Readers no longer have to depend on these well-paid arbiters of truth. For the first time, readers have direct access to original sources, to the unmediated documents. Readers no longer have to be passive consumers of news. They can inform themselves. Not only can they cut out the middleman, corporate media, but they can assess whether that middleman has been playing it straight with them. That's very bad news for an individual corporate journalist. At best, it strips them of any aura of authority and prestige. And at worst, it ensures that a profession already held in low esteem is considered even less trustworthy. And it's also very bad news for the media owners, those billionaires. They no longer control the news agenda. They no longer serve as institutional gatekeepers. They no longer define the limits of acceptable ideas and opinion. Second, WikiLeaks, the WikiLeaks revolution, sheds an unflattering light on the traditional model of journalism. It shows it to be inherently dependent on, and therefore complicit in, secret power. The lifeblood of the WikiLeaks model is the whistleblower, who risks everything to get public interest information that the powerful want concealed, because it reveals corruption, abuse, law-breaking. Think Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden. The lifeblood of corporate journalism, by contrast, is access. Corporate journalists make an implicit transaction. The insider delivers snippets of information to the journalist that may or not, may not be true, and that invariably serve the interests of unseen forces in the corridors of power. For both sides, the relationship of access depends on not antagonizing power by exposing its deep secrets. The insider is only useful to the journalist so long as he or she has access to power, which means that the insider is rarely going to offer up information that truly threatens power. If they did, they'd soon be out of a job, and they'd no longer be near power or useful to the journalist. But to be considered useful, the, the insider needs to offer the reporter information that appears to be revelatory, that holds out the promise for the journalist of career, success, and prizes. Both sides are playing a role in a game of charades that serves the joint interests of the corporate media and the political elite. At best, access offers insights for journalists into the power plays between the rival elite groups with conflicting agendas. 
between the more liberal elements of the establishment and the more hawkish elements. The public interest is invariably served only in the most marginal sense. We get a partial idea of the divisions within an administration or a bureaucracy, but very rarely the full extent of what's going on. For a brief period, the liberal components of the corporate media swapped out the historic access to join WikiLeaks in its transparency revolution. But they quickly understood that the dangers of the path they were embarking on, as the quote we began with from Assange makes clear. It would be a huge mistake to assume that the corporate media the corporate media feels threatened by WikiLeaks simply because the organization has made a much better fist of holding power to account than the corporate media. This isn't about envy, it's about fear. Journalists ultimately serve the interests of media owners and advertisers. These corporations have concealed power running our society. The pillars upholding this system of elite power, those disguising and protecting it, are the media and the security services, the mind and the muscle. The media corporations are there to protect corporate power using psychological and emotional manipulation, just as the security services are there to protect it using invasive surveillance and physical coercion. WikiLeaks disrupts this cosy relationship from both ends. It threatens to end the role of, corp of the corporate media in mediating official information, instead offering the public direct, direct access to official secrets. And in so doing, it dares to expose the tradecraft of the security services as they go about their law-breaking and abuses, and thereby imposes unwelcome sc scrutiny and restraint on them. In threatening to bring democratic accountability to the media and the security services, and exposing their long-standing collusion, WikiLeaks opens a window on how sham our democracies truly are. The shared desire of the security services and the corporate media is to disappear Assange in the hope that his revolutionary model of journalism is abandoned and forgotten for good. It won't be. The technology is not going away. And we must keep reminding the world that Assange, what, what Assange accomplished and the terrible price that he's paying for his achievement. Thank you very much.